It's no secret that enabling crop flowering within an optimal calendar window improves the potential for greater yields. However, forecasting these flowering windows will change with the warming climate and what growers can do about it is unexplored until now. Researchers, farming groups and industry organisations have all come together under the Optimising Irrigated Grains Initiative for an economics project that's more than just modelling. It uses real weather data and field trials with direct grower engagement to predict crops flowering windows and measure on-farm inputs and brings it all together in an online tool growers can use to help make more profitable decisions. And so what we did by using real weather, daily weather data measured from post offices for 111 years across eight different locations, so there's a lot of numbers, real numbers going into the model, we picked up the real effect of climate change, not just temperature but also rising atmospheric CO2. And what we found is that flowering times move forward. Now, while that was known, what we didn't necessarily know is the difference in the shift in optimal flowering times between rain-fed crops and irrigated crops. The sites were representative of the Australian wheat belt in New South Wales, in Victoria, in Tasmania and South Australia. What we found is the optimal flowering windows of rain-fed crops shifted forward by 2 to 43 days, which is quite uh, a long range for the second part of that shift and for irrigated crops between negative 6 and 19 days. So I say negative 6 because the optimal flowering window actually shifted backwards. So what that means is the optimal flowering windows of irrigated crops as affected by global warming was much lower. So the, the shift in optimal flowering times of irrigated crops was less than the impact in the shift of optimal flowering times of rain fed crops and that finding is new. Although irrigated crops use a relatively small agricultural land use area in Australia, about 1%, they do account for a quarter of Australia's gross agricultural value per year. So optimising these high value crops is worthwhile to our economy as well as growers. The key point of interest has been what is the difference in optimal flowering times of rain fed and irrigated crops? Is it any different? What should I do differently? And the main result that we've tried to confer or translate to them has been that irrigated crops are a little bit more forgiving in their sowing time. So if you happen to sow your crop a bit late and you know it's going to be irrigated, you can irrigate later and flower a bit later and get away with still achieving maximum yield potential. Whereas if it's a rain fed crop, you have to flower a little bit earlier in general, noting that the start of the optimal flowering time window is about the same for the rain fed and irrigated crops but the optimal flowering window for the irrigated crops is a little bit broader. So the insight is quite a useful one for irrigated growers. Um, if you've got a big farm and farmers can't sow all of their paddocks simultaneously, they start with one paddock and then three or four weeks later, or a couple of weeks later, they finish. So what happens is one of those sowing dates is unlikely to be optimal. Uh, so with an irrigated crop, if you happen to sow your crop a bit late, uh, and you know that it's a little bit later than your rain fed crops, you can irrigate. So the big advantage that irrigated crop growers have over rain fed crop growers in this case is greater flexibility and optimal flowering window. And while this type of simulation modelling has been used since the 1960s, what sets this research apart is a focus on real world testing and actual comparison of contemporary genotypes. Crop types are changing all the time as new disease resistance comes out, new phenologies come out, new development comes out. So we parameterised or calibrated our model so that we had realistic genotypes and crop types in the model. So they reflected the crop types you see behind me. So they actually flowered when they flower in reality. So the, the limitation with field experiments is that you can only do them over a finite period, over two or three or four years. With the simulation model you can use real weather and real measured phenology, so when crops develop, and you can simulate it over the long term. So we did 111 years and we picked up that change in global warming and we picked up that long term variation in flowering time. Some of these ones over here don't look like they've actually flowered. Yep. I suppose it's the La Nina, cool wet conditions. And so I guess that, that comes down to the development of um, uh, varieties for the long term. Yep. I think it really just highlights the need to um, test varieties over multiple seasons and multiple years and particularly systems modelling. The project has also had extensive and ongoing input from growers through real world testing and grower groups resulting in a free online tool called WaterCan Profit. 
It's a support tool that lets growers run the numbers on which scenarios will be most profitable for them. We built a decision support tool called Water Can Profit or a calculator based on feedback that we had from growers and we refined that decision support tool based on iterative feedback over the course of the project so that it was demand driven. What we did is we looked at whole farm optimisation. So that depends on a range of different factors. So we incorporated all of those main factors, water use, crop type, grain price, water price, variable costs. Uh, we got the user to put all of that into the calculator, the optimizer, and it will optimize in terms of profitability what your optimal use of irrigation is and your optimal crop type, the area of that crop type. It was good to put a quantitative statistic on it is that productivity doesn't always uh, translate to profitability. So you shouldn't be aiming for yield or productivity, you should be aiming for profitability.